We may remember a former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court who waged and lost a stubborn fight to keep a Ten Commandments monument in his courthouse. What is so memorable about this particular monument is how much it weighed. 5,280 pounds, or just over 500 pounds per commandment. <laughs> Judge Moore lugged it around from one public appearance to another on the back of a flatbed truck. The Atlantic Monthly noted that whenever the truck returned to Alabama, a 57-foot yellow I-beam crane dropped down to retrieve the rock from its chariot. And even this one, a five-ton crane, buckled visibly under the weight. Why have the Ten Commandments become such weighty burdens? Encumbrances most people can't even name, yet are perfectly content hanging around the necks of others and a rebellious society, in the judge's words, when what was intended from their inception was just the opposite. This opposing truth might best be represented by the fourth commandment, reimagined by in flesh, do not let life be defined by productivity. If we allow these ten teachings to remain just scriptural finger-wagging, thou shalt not, we may forget the positive, freeing practices they commend. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, the original fourth reads. Remarkably imaginative for its time and undeniably provocative still for our own. The holy did not intend the world to be a place of endless productivity and ambition with all its resulting anxieties and stress. Sabbath is an invitation to be free from the myth of scarcity that tells the lie that we'll never have enough or be enough unless we work ourselves to death. And it's not just for individuals this time of rest is admonished. It is a collective pause for the family unit, for employees, for animals employed in arduous agrarian work, for migrant workers and refugees settling into foreign worlds, and for the land itself. The focus was on protecting the health of the whole community to which end every expression of creation was deemed an interconnected and vital part. The Sabbath is rooted in mythic memory. As Exodus reads, For in six days God made the heavens and the earth, and the sea and all that they hold, but rested on the seventh. This is why God has blessed, blessed the Sabbath day and made it sacred. Rest is part of the very nature of God, in whose very image we are made. Deuteronomy offers another facet. To the Hebrew band formerly enslaved in Egypt, the Sabbath was a call to remember those 400 years of dehumanization, their ancestors reduced to machines of endless forced labor. The fourth commandment teases the now free community's imagination into a new economy, one in which rest is essential and brings the sacred sustenance only it can and honors our being as much as our doing. Rabbinical tradition says that each scripture has 70 faces. Each is like a gem that we hold up to the light of scrutiny and wonder, and in each turning, find some new meaning reflected. The Ten Commandments are such a stone, reimagined in the Bible itself and throughout history. Many of you have remarked how fresh this series has felt, but also remember that it is rooted in sacred traditions of reimagination. 
while so much of contemporary life is all about getting from here to there, Sabbath helps us get from there to here, to the present, which is the only place life is happening at any given moment anyway, present to others, present to our art and creativity, present in nature and physical activity, present in serving. Wherever our day lands us, whatever space we're in, Sabbath is time transformed when we're truly present. A member of our processional team each week, on which we're all welcome, by the way, shameless plug, they carry down our procession, leading our procession with a flame to remind us of the divine light in our midst and the divine light at the center of every heart. Awareness awakens. The air is anticipatory as we practice the presence of God together, as one mystic described worship, and as we await what another mystic called the luminous now. The singing bowl of the monastery or ashram signals something similar for monks. Time consecrated for meditation, attention totally attending the now. I remember being awakened by the Muslim call to prayer in Bethlehem in the occupied West Bank. The streets that stirred with the day's newness fell silent as newness now stirred in the hearts and embodied prayer of the people. And the air itself seemed to change. One of my lifelong friends who is a Buddhist likened Sabbath practice in his tradition to taking refuge. Refuge in the Buddha nature within and in the wisdom of the Buddha. These words, as he was sharing, reminded me of Jesus' words, which I shared aloud to my friend. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Abide in me as I abide in you. In his book, Kaddish, Leon Vizaltier reports on his decision after his father died to observe the practice of reciting the mourner's Kaddish a psalm-like acclamation that is said every day for many months after the death of a loved one. The process involves going to a synagogue and wrapping phylacteries around one's arms, leather bands with box-like chambers containing words of Torah, and then reciting the prayer. It is a discipline, much like the Sabbath in Jewish traditions. But one morning, Vaiseltia reports, I am standing in my phylacteries at dawn, and suddenly they feel different. They do not bind me, they gird me. It is said that it is not we who keep the Sabbath, but the Sabbath that keeps us. What a word for our contemporary life where movement is so often confused for progress and busyness is a badge of honor. And where slowing down or drawing boundaries around work life and pace is deemed weakness. Yes, we're quick in the art of quantity, but we've lost so much of life quality. Some decades ago, Australian anthropologists were allowed by some of the aboriginal peoples to observe and document the ancient ways they keep alive. So adept at foot travel on their daily nomadic wandering, the community would quickly leave the anthropologists in the dust. When they caught up hours later, the anthropologists were surprised to find the people waiting. And one day they asked the band's elders why they were so kind to wait for them and continue waiting, sometimes hours and hours more. Oh, we are not waiting for you, they were told. 
We're waiting for our souls to catch up. From here to there, and then from there to here, so our souls can catch up. Maybe the holiness of Sabbath of which those ancient authors wrote is about wholeness. Immersing our whole selves, heart and mind, spirit, soul and soma, our bodies, in healing rest, holding them in the same holistic tenderness as the divine holds us. I used to preach that really well and then do really well at the exact opposite until one phone call with my longtime mentor. And she said, Michael, you're working to rest instead of working from rest. Working myself into the ground, clawing for the next break, she helped me reimagine Sabbath, not as something reserved for a specific time or place or hour or day or vacation but as a quality of life from which all life emerges. It is tough wondering not only how we make a living, but how our living makes us. As Bonnie Miller McLemore so profoundly said it, faced as we are with all life's competing responsibilities. And yet sometimes we learn that more often than not, it is simply about learning to let go or as this overthinker before you is reminded repeatedly, to give the relentless racing mind a rest. In Sabbath, which is to say wherever and however we find a moment to remember to rest, we are restored by God who restores us to our true selves, our being human, and loves us back to life. It happens every time we remember the unshakable goodness at the core of our being and every other being on the planet, our value immeasurable by virtue of being, a living expression of the divine through the elemental dust and stones of an infinite, wondrous universe. I love what Peg Dolan said, that each of us is a word of God spoken only once. Why do we make ourselves and others so small? Sabbath reminds us of our true names. Sabbath can also be resistance, which brings strength to challenge whatever dehumanizes denies that sacred dignity in others, or reduces anyone or any creature or natural resource to a usable means of endless production and profit. Makes us fiercely honest with reality and the world as it is, so that in rest, we might dream of what the world can be. The peace for which we so yearn in these days does indeed begin within us, a reminder that it is always inner transformation that transforms what is outer. Father Gregory Boyle of Homeboy Industries here in LA, the largest gang rehabilitation program in the world, wrote about a former gang member in his program. Years of prison followed by years of rehabilitation and years of coming to know and believe in his own belovedness. The man now counsels others who are where he had once been. And he awakens each day and repeats a simple mantra to himself that now defines his life and work. Listen, listen. Love, love. Maybe the simplest, most profound reimagination of Sabbath I've ever heard. Listen. Listen. Love. Love. As I wrote this sermon this week, a song by a band that I love called The Head and the Heart has been on repeat in my head and heart, like a mantra. It pleads 
just for a moment, just for one moment, just for a moment, let's be still. A call to prayer, a call to live from sacred rest, a call from there to hear. So just for a moment, let's be still. Remembering each breath is filled with the love and goodness of a tender presence, reminding us how profoundly loved we are. In being excessively gentle with ourselves, we are free. And perhaps it is not we who reimagine Sabbath after all, but Sabbath that reimagines us and redefines our being in this world. Rest in that.